All right. Happy Monday, everyone. It's October 25th, and we are meeting the Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee uh, for the final discussion of Thrive Montgomery 2050. And um, we are going to be reviewing some final additional language that we've been going over, and uh, and I anticipate um, sending it on to the full council. And... Uh, where we can um, uh, take it up and I anticipate getting it passed uh, by the end of the calendar year. So um, thank you to staff. And we're joined here today by the commission. We got the chair, uh, Mr. Anderson, and we got Ms. Wright and Ms. Stern and Mr. Afsal and Ms. McCarthy. Um, so I guess we can we'll, we'll we'll get into it here in a second. I, I want to just say it from a again from an overview perspective here. Um, you know we've been working on this pretty uh, steadily um, for a couple months now, and I really feel like we've got a consensus document here. And you know today will be the final thing we have to kind of work through. But um, and we've grappled with issues. We've asked council staff and the planning team to sit down to the table and, you know, hammer out agreements. And they have done that time and again. And issues that have been brought to our attention um, have been addressed. Uh, you know, there's, uh, so again, I think we have a consensus document here and I'm, I'm hopeful and optimistic that the full council will read this and move forward. Um, you know, there's a lot more being said about things that are not in Thrive than what is actually in Thrive. And, um, and there, there's a, I know that there is confusion out there, but uh, I, I want to characterize once again, Thrive, what it does is it affirms the planning principles that we have already been putting into practice for quite some time. I, I would hail to the White Flint sector plan passed in 2010 as perhaps the first major plan that signaled a different vision for planning in Montgomery County and the corridors and um, smart growth and all of the issues that uh, reflect, I think, our contemporary approach to master plans. And every plan that we've done since then, you know, and there are so many, Rock Spring, White Flint 2, Long Branch, Silver, we're doing Silver Spring, Bethesda, uh, I mean, uh, Shady Grove, I mean, West Bard, like there are so many plans that we've done. They are implementing Thrive Montgomery 2050. And we've got a lot of folks who are acting as though there's going to be some major difference as a result of passing Thrive when in reality, we've actually, we've uh, updated the zoning and the master plans for for much of the county in a way that I think is reflects the same kind of planning goals as we're ratifying through Thrive. And <clears throat> there aren't a lot of major changes that would be, you know, that are contemplated in Thrive. That's one of the confusing elements of it. I think it is, as I said, it's reiterating and affirming a planning philosophy that frankly we have devised or evolved through master plans ahead of the general plan. And so now we're catching the general plan up to what we're doing. And um, and so I know that sort of countywide, all the, you know, there's there's a number of critics who come out on a countywide basis and gather together, maybe uh, seem to be like a lot of people. But, uh, you know, we have worked through these kinds of criticisms on a master plan by master plan basis for a long time. So, um, you know, the major major enhancements of Thrive are to identify the East County as a priority corridor, uh, to identify our corridors generally as a location for uh, future growth, uh, and to urge us to think a little differently about housing types and have more flexibility in our approach to different types of housing. It doesn't prescribe anything, you know, it doesn't change any zoning, it doesn't cause us to do anything in particular. Uh, but it says that these are principles that we hold dear. And I think we do hold them dear. If we 
don't, we would revisit all the master plans that we've passed and we would say, why did we do that? Why did we pass the Bethesda sector plan? You know, why did we do the Veersmere Coulter master, Coulter master plan? Why did we do the Forest Glen master plan? Because those plans are thrive in action. And, uh, you know, at some point you just had to sync the two up. You had to sync up the actual drive with, uh, you know, your actual general plan with your master plans. So, um, and, you know, I, again, I can, I want to thank my colleagues on the committee here. You know, I think we have worked together well and we have smoothed out and come to agreement on a lot of different issues. And that's why I say, I think what we're sending to the council will be reflects a consensus view. And, um, you know, I, I hope that the council will read it as such. Um, so I know that that, you know, that there are plenty of things swirling about there. Um, but we'll ask our council colleagues to judge Thrive based on what it is, not what it isn't, you know, to read it carefully. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm confident in that light, you know, there'll be strong support for moving forward. Um, so I don't know if my colleagues want to make any comments. Otherwise, I'll turn it to Pam and we'll go to the packet and we can ask planning, you know, they'll, if you had any other overarching comments you wanted to make, um, certainly invite you to do that. Otherwise, they can come out in the course of our conversation today. All right, Pam. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, uh, Council Member Reamer is correct. This is our ninth and our likely last work session with the committee on the Thrive Montgomery 2050 draft plan. Um, the last time we met, we talked about parks and recreation. Um, but today, what we're doing is covering some uh, broader sections of the plan. We are going to be looking at the conclusion because now we're at the end. Um, we're going to go back and revisit the introduction. We had covered um, talking to the committee about that in July. It was the last work session in July, but it's now been um, revised. We're going to have some conversations about the introduction. Um, and then there were some additional items that have come up since the last work session or over the course of our review time together. Um, and we'll go through those. And some of those additional items are actually follow-up items that were requested by um, council members or committee members. Um, so if you're on the second page of the staff report, um, again, just as council member Reamer mentioned, um, at the top of that page are what the planning department sent over as the goals of Thrive. Um, and they are to, again, look at maintaining a constrained growth area, um, introducing East County growth corridors, uh, placing an emphasis on East-West growth corridors and transit, protecting the agricultural reserve um, and making it relevant to the county and accessible and looking for ways to think about growth in different ways, like parking lots of places and complete communities and 15 minute living. So is this generalized theme that we've been talking about for weeks now uh, with all the chapters in the plan. Um, and just like to reiterate that every time so people that are just joining for the first time or get a taste of what this is about. Um, so we're going to jump right in with the additional items. And the first one we have for you is the carbon footprint analysis. Um, since 2010, the planning board has included a carbon footprint analysis and recommendations to reduce VMT or vehicle miles traveled as well as greenhouse gas emissions in each of the county's master plans. And this is to satisfy a requirement of county code in Chapter 33A. Um, and the general plan is treated like any other master plan in this regard. It thus requires it to have um, a carbon footprint analysis. And on October 13th, the planning department transmitted the required evaluation for Thrive Montgomery 2050. And it's attached to this staff report on pages 1 through 19, circle pages 1 through 19. Um, and basically, the result of that analysis for Thrive indicates that the recommendations in the plan will help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the county's overall carbon footprint due to reductions in VMT, which is vehicle miles traveled, reductions in the use of energy in buildings and infrastructure, and the sequestration of carbon in the atmosphere through reduction in tree loss, increases in tree cover, and the protection of forested areas. Um, and if you want to look just at the numbers that are related, sort of that uh, conclusion, those are on the very last page of the carbon footprint analysis and sort of Circle 19. Do you guys have any questions on that? So again, the headline is uh, Thrive's recommendations would reduce our greenhouse gas impact. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great. The second uh, thing that the um, committee has received is, um, well, on October 6th, the county executive sent a letter that we, the committee received a copy of as well to the Maryland Department of Planning. Uh, requesting a supplementary review of the planning board draft of Thrive Montgomery. 
Uh, and the CE cited the extent of revisions and critical changes to the working draft, which became the public hearing draft, um, that MDP had reviewed back in November 2020. So they wanted them to take a second look. Um, and MDP replied to the executive's request on October 15th. That's also attached on Circle 22 through 27. Um, and MDP expressed appreciation for inclusion in this planning process and clarified its role as one focused on ensuring that the minimum state requirements for Charter County comprehensive plans are met. So in doing so, and in looking at uh, the planning board draft, um, they did have a couple recommendations or responses to two elements that are required to be included in any comprehensive plan. And one is the housing element, and the other is the water resources element. And for the housing element, there were two, two recommendations. Um, and the first one was a suggestion to add definitions related to low income and workforce housing in line with a house bill, a state house bill, um, which passed in 2019. Um, and council staff is looking at those definitions because they don't exactly meet the definitions in our county code for those income levels. And Ms. McMillan is also in this meeting and she can comment on that if you need me, but um, that's still under um, review. And so we'll have something further for the committee on that um, in the next week or so. We'll write a memo about it. Okay. Well, I got to say this little effort from the county executive looked to me like, you know, a, a Hail Mary to try to stop Thrive. It was just, uh, <laughs> so I appreciate the Maryland Department of Planning's, you know, patient response. And, uh, you know, how many times has the county executive tried to stop Thrive? Uh, you know, yet he'll probably deny that publicly, but uh, okay. Thank you for that. Um, the second recommendation that um, the Maryland Department of Planning had re regarding the housing element was um, there's data in the plan that references the housing needs assessment that was done in July of 2020. And so they're just requesting that it be adopted by reference or get included as an appendix to the plan. Um, so council staff agrees with that. It's just uh, recommend, su recommends that the committee support uh, that recommendation. Okay. That good. Okay. Um, the other recommendation that Maryland Department of Planning made um, was with respect to the water resources plan. And it made a suggestion that it too should be adopted by reference in the body of the plan or at a minimum be included by reference in the appendix, appendix A of the planning board draft as other elements are included in appendix A. And the reality is that it really was in appendix A already. It just um, had appeared under a heading that I think made it unclear to the Department of Planning as they reviewed the document that it was actually in there. So planning staff have included, and it's in your packet on Circle 28, a revised um, text to, to Appendix A to clearly show where the sensitive areas uh, plan and language is located, that reference, and the reference to the water resources plan as well. And that should satisfy the recommendation by MDP. Sounds good. Um, okay, so next we go into the follow-up items. Um, and the first one are edits to the text. So as we've gone through each of these six work sessions prior that were devoted to each chapter of the plan, um, we brought to you these clean versions of the document that have been revised based on collaboration between the planning department, the planning board chair, and council staff. Um, and then as we went through the work session, committee members have made some further changes to that clean draft with additional text edits, or um, we covered comments that came in from the public or the executive branch that brought forward during the work session for the first time some language that you had not yet seen, and so that, that possibly got endorsed or revised. Um, so all of the text changes that have been made by the committee are included on circles 29 through 34, and I just wanted to put them there, and it was easier not to, like, make the staff report twice as long by putting them in the body of the staff report, but they're there and they're open for conversation if you want to... Um, Talk about that. All right. We will have some further discussion of more text changes in a few minutes that have to do with text in the introduction. We just haven't gotten there yet. So I just, these are okay. all related to the compact growth, complete communities, design arts and culture, transportation, housing, and parks chapters that you've reviewed. Okay. okay. So is this the time then to bring up the uh, the energy piece, or is that uh, that's already in there for parks? We're going to talk about that when we talk about the introduction. Introduction. That's back to the introduction. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Friedson. 
Yeah. Did you want to talk about the maps piece of this now, or did you want to set aside that for, for later? So that would actually be next. The next item is to talk about further explanations. And if that's okay. what you're referring to, so in one of our follow-up items, um, Council Member Friedson, you had requested that planning staff come with um, some further information and ex explanation about the um, context or the comparison of the growth map that occurs in Thrive um, and the growth map that, it, or a map that occurs in the growth and infrastructure policy, as well as our sewer service area map in the county. Um, and so they have written that explanation. They had some maps included to that explanation, and those are on Circle 35 through 37 of the plan. Yeah, so I, I can speak to that, Mr. Chair. Please, yeah. Well, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate the work that's gone into this. I, I got to say, though, I, I do still find the connectivity or, or lack thereof of the various maps somewhat problematic and unclear. Uh, and, you know, I think we're still hearing from residents uh, who, who feel that way as well. Uh, you know, I think we can move forward, but I do think between now and full council review, uh, I at least would like to request that we have a cohesive document created that builds upon the explanation that is included in the packet that's more expansive and provides some added clarity about how the various pieces of the planning process work together to create a comprehensive whole. I mean, that's the whole purpose of this exercise in a general uh, plan, just you know, explaining how the maps relate to one another. Uh, you know, I don't think we can say that the growth and infrastructure map and the water and sewer maps are completely and apart separate from the growth map. I mean, certainly they are part of the uh, the growth. So, you know, I, I think uh, with some of the, uh, you know, supplemental additions as references in the plan, uh, as we're suggesting and we just agreed to uh, with the uh, state uh, planning department, um, you know, I think we could do something similar here as a reference, uh, but I do think it's important that uh, we we reference the different maps, explain how they move together. If the argument is one map is for four years and the other map is for 30 years and, and they move together in a, you know, a, a different pattern, fine. Uh, but we have to show how they work together and how they are, you know, achieving uh, similar uh, end, end goals from my perspective. So I just wanted to uh, note that I think a reference document of some sort that could be included in the appendix uh, outlining how all the pieces work together uh, would help to alleviate some of these issues. And I think would uh, address the concern that I have raised that it is unclear to most folks who look at different maps and don't understand why they look different. Okay. Yeah, good point. I mean, um, this is an area where, um, if I'm understanding, you know, what you're, what you're sort of identifying, which I agree, people are looking at the broad Thrive map with its three categories, right? The, you have the quarter, designation which is what's the, what's the how, what is the what's the words used there uh quarter focused growth area quarter focused growth area limited growth and then, and the then you have right, the next area. the next surrounding uh area which is the limited growth and then you have the rural agricultural right or the agricultural um as i said to a community uh leader today like it's a bit of a Rorschach test. Like, does limited growth mean that you're trying to limit growth there, or does it mean you're allowing limited growth there? <laughs> um, and, you know, well, you have to look a little deeper. So the maps that Councilman Friesen that you asked us to present here today show a little more and that the next layer, right? It's like a layering of these maps. So you've got the most broad uh, policy, which is generally speaking, we're not encouraging growth in the limited growth area. Like that's why it's called limited. And then look at the next map and you can see how water sewer affects that. Water sewer has a major limitation on growth. Now it's not, it's not the same policy document. And so we can't you know, we're not writing into stone the water sewer categories uh, through Thrive, um, but you can see how they are, how they interact today 
you know, based on policy that we're all embracing and then look further at the growth and in infrastructure. And that can tell you how certain development rules and taxes and other things interact. So it's a layering that I think you have to look at them all together. I think that's really your point, you know, to actually understand what is intended. And then even from there, really, you have to look at your master plan, <laughs> you know, and it, frankly, it might be useful to have another map that shows these master plan areas because Thrive doesn't override any of the master plans, right? Miss Wright. Yeah, I, I wanted to sort of build on what you were, were just saying on page um, circle 36, we have our zoning map with the Thrive growth area boundaries. And to me, that is a key map. We make land use decisions based on master plans, which are then implemented by applying different zones to individual pieces of property. When you look at the map on Circle 36, which is our current zoning, again, which reflects our master plans, you see how the, thrive, the three Thrive areas of corridor focused growth, limited growth, and our rural and agricultural areas um, match up to the zoning. We then create various tools to help us implement the visions of our zones. And those tools include the growth and infrastructure policy, our water and sewer policy, and, and, and others. So the idea really is, is that the, the central theme, which we believe um, is, should be, as, as you put it, sort of put in stone or immortalized in stone, is what you see on Circle 36. Right. On page 30, Circle 37, you see how we are implementing that vision in the different areas. And what the growth and infrastructure map simply means is these are the areas where we require greater or less mitigation for traffic. That's really what the growth and infrastructure map is. And that's what the you know, red, yellow, red, orange, yellow, and green areas are, where we actually require greater uh, impact taxes to mitigate traffic. And a lot of that is based on how far you are from transit and uh, so on. It doesn't change the zoning of a piece of property, but it has to do with how we mitigate traffic. The sewer map, and, and this is something that, you know, I think um, has been confusing for people, is, is we, we really aren't um, creating land use with our sewer map. It, that, it's the other way around. Our land use reflects where it's appropriate to provide sewer service. And, you know, I think that a lot of people believe that our sewer plan is a major land use tool. And we really would like people to think that the land use tool is actually the master plan and the zoning. And that sewer plan is a way to implement that. It is not um, you know, a land use tool in and of itself. We're trying to implement what you see on page circle 36, not create another layer of land use recommendations. So uh, when we talked about how the growth and infrastructure map and the sewer service maps were tools, it's sort of implementation tools, they are in service of trying to put in place the land uses that you see on th Circle 36. And we use those land uses to help us. And you can clearly see how the areas from the Thrive Growth Map relate to those land uses. So to speak directly to our friends in Darnstown, someone has their... Uh... Someone might mute. Thank you. I know that, for example, they would like to be recognized at this highest level of the Thrive Map as more rural and agricultural, but we cannot put 
developed uh you know residential communities into the agricultural zone of our overall county map i mean that would be very much in contradiction with the goal and the kind of essence of the agricultural zone so it would it would be harmful to the ag reserve to put darnstown into the ag reserve through that level of the map because um, then it would seem to imply you can build substantial residential communities in the ag reserve so you know i feel like we're not we can't do that um and we just need to I, I don't know we need to just to be clear I, I was suggesting i mean that's a separate but related issue but i was suggesting here that there be a reference in the document as an appendix just like we did with several items related to planning's suggestions which we all thought was a good idea to make clear how these different maps interact because sure. it is extremely confusing i'm not sure that the argument of well they're just different deal with it which seems to be the approach that we're taking is the right approach i think that we have to explain and we have an obligation to explain how they interface with each other and how they're part of a aligned comprehensive strategic plan for growth in the county which is the entire purpose of this exercise that's what i'm you know suggesting here I, i've been raising this issue from the beginning i appreciate all the work that has gone into trying to address it i think that we have made progress but we haven't quite hit what i was hoping to accomplish here and i'm just suggesting you know when we go to full council just you know giving some thought to an appropriate reference appendix that addresses how these different maps interface with one another to reach the ultimate goal as you have suggested and and, and just went through and explained uh, director right you know i think it would be a helpful message to provide some additional clarity to the public right and i think so that's basically what i'm also saying that it would be useful to have some additional language explaining how these different maps interact and i, I guess i'm unclear whether you have that now um you know you've provided these maps here but is this actually text for thrive or is this well we in did include a narrative which in essence tried to say what i just said in words yeah. but in a page and a half of text and we could absolutely you know we would support the idea of having an appendix or um yeah. it, that would essentially have some of this text and we can even put a finer point on it if you think the text wasn't clear enough and uh the maps and explain you know as that piece is entitled three maps three different purposes but try to explain how those purposes are interrelated and, so, and i would just can i just make one last point i don't think having the title of this being three different maps for three different purposes is the right message we want to yeah. send I, I specifically I understand the, the the explanation yeah to to the chair's point and sorry to uh uh interrupt but the, the the whole point here is we have to be able to explain how all of the maps are moving towards the same overarching vision for growth in the county that they are not contradictory to one another they may have different purposes they may accomplish uh and focus on different things but if they are going to work and if this is going to be a comprehensive strategic plan for growth for the next 30 years in the, the county they have to be moving in the same direction they have to be interfacing with one another so i fundamentally believe that the three different maps for three different purposes is not a strong and compelling argument that adds clarity to the public it has to be you know different maps that reach the same goal well, can I uh, let me let me suggest growth policy. Let me suggest we not think about this as an appendix assignment, but it I mean, why couldn't it be a page in the plan? It's sort of like understanding how the maps work together. You know, and it just It certainly could be. I was just trying to yeah. make a suggestion to 
yeah. um, you know, be but, constructive. But I, I absolutely I'm certainly not agree. married to where it's located, but I do think as a reference, it's important to make the point and to explain not that these are three different maps for three different purposes, but that our maps and our you know vision here all coincide to get to you know, ultimately some idea of what we want the county's growth pattern pattern broadly to be. Understand that this doesn't decide where sewer goes. It doesn't decide what zoning goes where. That's not the purpose of of this, but it does set forth a broad based thousand foot vision for where and how we grow the type of communities that we build. That's the purpose of yeah. the general plan. Yeah, I think we could have an insert, you know, it could be part of wherever the map was. I think it could be there or you could you could figure out where to put it. But it could be like as you as you've written at least a draft in the packet, you know, it present it's like understanding the maps. And it's got the overall Thrive map, but then it's got the current version of these other maps and it explains how everything layers and interacts. And then it notes that some maps will change with the ongoing policy adaption and some will be more enduring. Um, I think that would be clarifying. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's, I suppose it's an unavoidable that we've probably spent more time than anything talking about the maps because a picture tells a thousand, you know, a, a thousand words, a story of a thousand words. And whether it's accurate or not, you know, that's the human inclination is to go right to the picture and try to get the whole story. So let's try to satisfy that as best we can. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, again, a brief segment, I don't know where it could be fit, but that kind of explains this all would be a reassuring to those who don't know what limited growth means uh, or are concerned that we don't, you know, it's not clear. And then they can see the various levels of refinement and B, I think it'd just be useful for the average person to understand what that means. Chair Anderson. I, I was just going to note, there are a number of places in the document where I think we're going to find similar sorts of uh, questions being raised about, you know, ironing out uh, clarifications and things like that. And I just thought, you know, perhaps it would help you expedite your work if you just noted those, and then we can continue to work with individual members of the Fed Committee and council staff and have some, you know, tweaks ready before the full council takes up these up and work sessions. Because I think you're going to find there's a number of these points where there's no fundamental disagreement, but we just need to continue with some wordsmithing or some drafting of additional explanatory material and it's not really a question of anybody has a particular difference of opinion exactly so we'll ask you to do that and we're gonna you know we're done with thrive today at fed so we'll ask you to come back and circulate something to us at the committee and we'll send it on when it goes to full council you know assuming that the committee all supports what you give us so it'll be it'll be in there when it goes to full council. All right. So back to where we were. Sam. Hey. Um, thank you. So if we move on, we're now still <laughs> on page four, but at the bottom. Um, and this is another follow-up item was outreach. And you'll recall that in the work sessions in July, the committee had expressed interest in additional outreach to the community. Um, and on September 27th, the council held a town hall to solicit additional input. Um, the town hall did cover multiple topics, but there were quite a few questions that were uh, put forth during that town hall and quite a few that were written in um, about the Thrive Montgomery plan. 70 of those um, questions were about Thrive and a majority related to housing and zoning. I think 50, 54 of the 70 questions were. Um, the other topics that did touch on uh, things that the town hall related to Thrive were the environment outreach and just Thrive in general. Um, and then in addition to that, Councilmember Jawando held um, a roundtable with African-American leaders. I mean, he had indicated in the summer his interest in doing this and had asked um, council staff to help and assist. And that occurred in, I think, um, maybe September or uh, October. Maybe it was October. Great. Um, Great. Let's hear about it. I'd like Councilmember Jawando, please. Sure. Yeah. Miss uh, Carolyn Chen was very helpful and participated. Um, and I appreciate the the uh, 
the update and the inclusion of this in the packet, you know, one of the things that I had expressed when I asked staff to help us put these together was that the African American community, Black community, was one community that when we had the public hearing at the council, we had very low representation. You know, I think it was two individuals and they both knew each other who out of 60 some people. And I had asked questions about, you know, well, who did we, you know, the NAACP had reached out to me as well and said they had not been formally spoken to. And so I think I thought this was an important conversation to have, especially now that there was something to react to. And this is also obviously I understand planning did a ton of record outreach and worked very hard at this. But I think it's just a this underscores the importance of how hard this is and that we can do better and more. And I think that as we especially as we head into the actions, as we review the actions document going forward and, you know, move forward trying to implement, I think the good thing is that there's real still opportunity to engage thought leaders and do more of this kind of, you know, granular outreach as we move forward. And so we heard from, you know, if I had to summarize, I think there's a document that Ms. Chen pulled together that hopefully we sent around. If not, we will. But a lot of it was, you know, it's some frustration and kind of exactly how to engage with it. Had not having heard about it before, you know, so we had to spend a lot of time kind of going through like what the general plan was, which I know this is this happens a lot. What the what the goals are, how it sets the vision. And, you know, I think for me that underscored that it was useful. And then once we got through that, we did get some, you know, some comments about wanting to see, which I think Thrive does do a good job of, but particularly in East County, we talk about East County and Up County a lot. And that, you know, obviously having an economic development and connected corridor in East County and, you know, highlighting that and correcting some of the past land use decisions. We talked about that a bit. And so I think that that was kind of a, you know, high level summary of what we talked about. But what I committed was that as we move through, again, this sets a vision. It's going to go to full council. There's still opportunity for for input and engagement. And then there's this list of actions. So I just think that, you know, this is a thing I'd like to work with council staff and planning to continue to engage, you know, thought leaders from a diverse array of groups as we continue through the kind of implementation all along the way. And I think that's something that stuck out to me. I don't know if Ms. Chen's on, if she wanted to add anything. I don't know if she's here today, Pam. Is she on this? She's not on right now. Let me see if she's available. She did. I will put forth that Ms. Chen has worked on a very elaborate document. She has actually done quite a bit of outreach to different groups as well. And Ms. McMillan and I are working with her to bring forward a whole memo for the committee, primarily from Ms. Chen, about what she had worked on all through August and September as far as outreach goes. So that document is still coming. We just didn't have time before this session to get it all pulled together. Okay, got it. And I think what happened was I saw a draft and provided feedback and it's not, it didn't go yet. So we want to be able to provide a full picture with it. So the material she's already gotten done is admirable. It's a ton of work. It's a lot of information. So what we hope to add to that is the story around it. What motivated the outreach? You know, who did the outreach? How did it occur? Why did the groups get chosen? That sort of thing. Yeah, I appreciate that. And so that's the last thing I'd say just to my colleagues is that in addition to this roundtable, which I personally participated in the African-American, there was this other outreach that was kind of a part of these other focused groups that happened and that was staffed by our staff. So I think it was all positive and just hopefully we can continue this, you know, kind of work going forward. Thank you. Excellent. Glad you did that. Councilmember Friedson. Thank you. A couple of things. One, I appreciate Councilmember Gerardo, your work on this and council staff's work on this. I got to say that I'm a little surprised that some of this is the first time we're hearing about it. 
in a, a public setting of, of, of some of the outreach that uh, has happened. And I, I think we have to be more intentional and, and communicative about how this outreach is coming to make sure that we're uh, addressing uh, everybody's ability to participate in, in that outreach. Uh, you know, so I just hope that as we move forward, I look forward to reading that document, but um, uh, you know, if this was follow-up specifically from the committee's work um, and the committee's uh, interest and recommendations in, in moving this forward, you know, it sounds like Councilmember Jawando was part of part of this effort, which I appreciate. Uh, but, but you know, I, at least one committee member here was not aware of uh, much or any of it, and and I just don't think that that is uh, appropriate. And so, I, I just hope that as we move forward, we are communicating better of what we're doing. I think the work is positive, uh, but it is a little bit troubling that, uh, you know, we're not uh, communicating uh, with each other as the process is occurring, particularly if, if this is an effort uh, to uh, do better outreach. You know, for instance, you know, I, I've done, you know, a dozen or more uh, civic association meetings over the last couple of months. I don't count that as formal council outreach. I count that as my personal council member uh, outreach, and so I just think we have to, if we're going to do this, we have to institutionalize it and and formalize it and 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 make it less, uh, you know, kind of informal uh, uh, and and better communicated and, and and more public, including having it on the website, having it on our agendas, having it as you know part of the packet, not after uh, it's happened, but before it happens, so that folks know uh, where and how uh, to access it. I, I you know I appreciate the effort and the interest in doing it. I just you know, think that there are ways to 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 improve upon it and do it better uh, moving forward. Uh, also, just wanted to ask the question about the October or excuse me, September the 29th town hall. There's a lot of confusion here of whether or not that was a Thrive town hall or not. You know, this uh, committee had expressed an interest in not slowing down the process necessarily, but providing additional feedback. There was a suggestion of a potential September town hall that had started. Uh, at least my understanding was, you know, I thought when it was scheduled that it was going to be a Thrive Town Hall, it expanded to be a broad town hall about all kinds of topics. There was, you know, it was a 90 minute meeting. I think there was about, you know, 60 plus minutes of presentations. You know, we did more time talking to residents than we did hearing uh, from residents. And so I just wanted to get clarification from council staff, whether that is seen as being a, a Thrive Town Hall, which is generally how it's been Reference and let me act. let me add on. It should not be. I mean, it was not a Thrive Town Hall. I, uh, to your point. Yeah, like, yeah. So I, I yeah, I appreciate. It. I just is is the is the thought that that was a Thrive Town Hall and that has satisfied the committee's suggestion and and, and recommendation, or is the thought that it wasn't? I mean, you've obviously heard from the chair, and I think you can get a sense for what my thought is on that. And I think Councilmember Johanda was the first person to suggest it, and I kind of seconded it. Uh, so I don't want to speak for him, but I know that he had strong uh, feelings about that. So I just wanted to get a sense of that from council staff. Uh, we did not coordinate what would get included in the town hall. Yes, I think initially it was talked about as being a Thrive Town Hall. I think the council as a body had a lot of things um, of interest to the public. Um, and what I will guess is not a lot of days in which those things could get covered. Um, and so a decision was made to add some critical issues that are of interest to other residents at the same time as gathering information from Thrive. Um, if the will of the committee and the council is that even more outreach or listening time needs to happen, if your schedule permits it, I'm sure that can happen. Um, I'll, I'll just say before, uh, so I think it's disingenuous to suggest even remotely that that was a Thrive Town Hall. It was a town hall that was informational to the public and there were I believe two questions uh, on 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 thrive that were uh, uh, that were able to be asked that were sent in in, in advance I, I think to suggest that that was you know to get additional input and feedback specifically on thrive is just not uh, reasonable to, to the public and so I, I don't think that that addresses the council's uh, interests and, and and requests I will say I'm not bringing this up to be critical, I do think that we have to be honest and serious about how we frame things. And I don't think suggesting it uh, that way is accurate or appropriate. 
But I think that now we have made significant changes in the Fed committee. I think that we have listened to a substantial amount of community input here. I think the staff working with planning has done really important work in trying to address some of these changes. And I do think it would be appropriate now that we have a Fed recommendation, again, without slowing down the process, to have a town hall to get feedback as the council, full council, takes this up. I think that we need to get moving on that very quickly to schedule it if it's going to happen. But I do think that a formalized public outreach, town hall I would include in that by the council, is what the committee had recommended before. And I don't think that we have satisfied that commitment. All right. Well, I mean, if you want to do a, so first of all, we need to get Thrive done. And we need to do it by the end of the calendar year. And that's what we've been saying we will do. And I don't think there's any reason why we shouldn't be able to do that. If council members want to have a Thrive town hall where there's no other topic, and we can get a presentation about the amended version, I think that could be okay. I think we should do it really soon, like next week. And we could ask planning to do the presentation, taking the amended version. So I don't have any objection to doing that. And I will say, so we did talk about doing some additional town halls, I think that, or community outreach, you know, Councilman Richawano did a meeting. And I think that the idea of doing a town hall, clearly the council president decided that there were other issues for the town hall. So lost in translation. It may not have been, you know, the urgency of doing a town hall focused just on Thrive may not have been communicated to the council president. I don't know. I just want to say, I tried very hard to communicate that. And I think that it just, it happened the way it happened, but I would just, and to look forward, I'd agree. I think doing something now, since we have a new document and having something dedicated would be appropriate. So I agree with that. And I also agree with Councilman Fries. And I, just so you know, I wasn't as in the loop on the other outreach activities that were happening either. And so I just think it was not because it was, I think council staff was just trying to get it done. And, but we do need to institutionalize that going forward, which is part of it. To clarify, just to your point, that was a broad statement. And I do appreciate the work that you did to do outreach. And like I said, I was, you know, doing, you know, constituent outreach and civic association outreach, you know, as well. We've had, you know, probably a dozen or more, you know, meetings and efforts and have, you know, done our best to do that, you know, for my team. But I don't consider that to be, you know, council. Like, we'll bring the feedback as best as we can and appreciate that you had council staff there, which is even better. And, you know, we'll bring that feedback to us, which I look forward to seeing that report from Ms. Chen. But, you know, I just wanted to double down on what I was attempting to say earlier, that it wasn't specific, but more broad that, you know, just we need to, we need to be better aware of what is happening if it's happening on behalf of the committee. Okay, thank you. So, well, let me go back there for a second, Pam. So, Ms. Chen conducted some outreach and is preparing a report for us. Can you share that again? Yeah. So, and Ms. Chen is on the... Oh, hi. There she is. She joined us. And she can speak to it as well. Really, it was a, it was a level of council staff effort that came from the handful of work sessions that occurred in July. You know, it seemed like there was interest in getting more outreach and outreach to what appeared to be maybe groups that were less aware of what was happening with the document than some of the traditional groups. There was also a lot of drafting going on. So, we were fortunate enough that Ms. Chen could step in and assist Ms. McMillan and I, and she set up a program of making efforts and outreach, and she can talk about those. She has also put a lot of that on paper, and we're going to write a full memo, and we'll go to the committee, and then can get attached to a council packet. 
Miss Chen, welcome. Can you? Uh... Yes, hello. Hi. I'm very excited to be here. I didn't think we'd get to this item agenda, so uh, agenda item. So I'm excited. Uh, the original outreach was a response to a Fed session in July, where the Fed committee wanted uh, not just uh, a roundtable for African American leaders, but a more diverse outreach to any missed grouper audiences uh, from the extensive planning outreach that that had occurred. Uh, I think a couple of communication miscommunication channels comes from uh, one trying to set up a town hall in early September in August during recess. And we, I originally had staffed two other council staff to run all the focus groups with me, um, who have since uh, left the, left the council. Uh, so what we have now is a summary of common themes and points that were uh, done. Uh, specific organizations, um, individuals, places of work uh, that were not covered in the traditional methods of outreach uh, in the appendix made sure that it was a uh, different type of outreach and different information so that it was not duplicative. And uh, uh, Ms. Dunn, Ms. McMillan and I spoke last week to actually lay that out in detail, the methodology on how the outreach uh, was done. Um, in addition, the while the, the town hall in September was uh, included Thrive on it, we, uh, we meaning the uh, public information office, we addressed all the issues that came up and all the constituent questions, as well as HHS and MCPS issues. Um, however, the majority of the questions that were written in were actually Thrive related. And that might have been because of an early uh, advertisement that it was uh, that we would be covering Thrive. Every single one of those questions, line item by line item of those questions is included in the draft uh, document put together uh, that some have received. I think uh, Mr. Afzal and um, uh, Bridget as well looked at a draft um, So and some other council staff. So we'll be expanding upon that. Uh, so it includes uh, the majority of the questions that came from Thrive as a subset from the full council town hall and uh, it's been analyzed by district uh, as we've collected zip code information uh, so district and what type of question uh, and category all questions were categorized so we have a majority of 85 percent of the write-in questions um, for the council town hall from district one and district five uh, and the 60 percent more than 60 percent of the questions was on affordable housing and single family uh, residential zoning. And so that all information is there and all we responded to those constituents using um, the myths and facts uh, one pager that was posted on the planning department as well as the uh, video responses that uh, Mr. Anderson posted online. Um, so I think these, this outreach does not um, duplicate uh, what was done, uh, because actually what was done was extremely extensive. It was actually outreach to audiences that had never heard of the plan, Thrive Montgomery, or, or Wedges and Corridors. And so the presentation was general in terms of what, what would be important for you to know in order to engage uh, productively on this plan going forward. There was no intention to stop or slow down the process. It was more of what can we do going forward, uh, mm -hmm. and that includes more more focus groups on uh, additional amendments from the committee before it goes to full council. Okay, oh. you, have tell, you have me until the last. <laughs> <minutes> there, <laughs> okay. saying this was just on the committee level, and so yeah. knowing that once it goes to full council, there will probably be additional outreach uh, by other council members of the full council. So. This was just a subset for now. Okay. Well, we're not seeking. Okay. Um, we're not. Okay. I mean, we're, we're not seeking to send a half finished piece of work to the full council. So, <laughs> I, I mean, as a committee. Um, so, you know, thank you for your outreach. And it sounds like it will be a good uh, addition to our outreach appendix. Um, do we do we decide to have an outreach appendix, or do we just expand the introduction and talk more about outreach in the introduction? I think maybe with that. Uh, Director, do you want to comment on that? 
what I would say is I think there's both. There's the appendix, which is broader, has a lot more detail in it. And then you at one of the work sessions in July had requested that language regarding outreach get added right. to the introduction, and that's what's been done. Right. Yes, that's exactly. So I, it's going to be both. There will be language uh, in the, uh, I think it's actually in the conclusion, not the introduction, but I can't remember. It's in one of the two, and uh, it is um, it is also going to, we're still going to keep the um, appendix. Okay, I'm glitching a little bit here, if you can hear me or not, but um, that sounds good. So I think, Ms. Chen, I think it would be helpful to conceive of your outreach report as being part of the outreach appendix. And if there, you know, if there's any, I mean, we, if there is any, uh, if there's any language you want to suggest that we consider for the introduction, you would need to please get it to Ms. Dunn in the next day or so, so that it could be reviewed by the committee. I would, I do not want to please have a separate recommendation coming to the full council. So if there's something you'd like for us to take a look at, if you could please get it to us. Okay, good. Well, I hope those were productive meetings and thank you, Carolyn, for doing that. Um, all right, back to where we were. Uh, so with that, I would turn to page five of the staff report. Um, and here is, we're gonna revisit the introduction. So in July, we had talked about the introduction. There have been a lot of questions posed to the committee about the nature of the introduction, the material in the introduction. Um, material that had been in the public hearing draft versus material in the planning board draft um, and got a lot of feedback. It's listed at the top of page five. The committee weighed in on a lot of things and that was really helpful. So planning staff and council staff and the planning board chair worked together to come up with a revised clean version of this introduction. It is attached um, on circles 38 through 47. Um, doesn't have graphics, things like that. Typically when we do the clean version, we've been mostly just sticking to text as much as possible. Um, all the graphics and all of that are gonna get reviewed. Um, but in addition to that, we do get correspondence and sometimes the correspondence comes between getting that clean version done or as staff is preparing things, pulling that back out, looking and finding, was there any correspondence related to this? And the, and the council did receive a letter from Tiffany Ward, who is the um, director of the Office of um, Racial Equity and Social Justice. And she had several suggestions um, and some stuff had already been covered by committee. She wanted a separate chapter on racial equity and social justice. That was her recommendation, but the committee had already weighed in on that. The committee made that decision in July to keep the planning board's format. So that's not addressed, but there were a handful of suggestions related to text and they all, almost all of them were in the introduction to the draft. And so that's what you'll see on the bottom of page five and at the top of page six, you'll see um, an effort to incorporate her, her comments um, language that strengthens some of these ideas under the racial equity and social justice sections of the introduction. Um, I did speak with Ms. Ward today. She was invited to the meeting and had a conflict. Um, and she said she may have a couple small tweaks to this language, um, but nothing substantive. And so I want to open to the. Okay. Sorry, can you say that again? Who had comments? Uh, Ms. Ward. Um, she was the one who provided the original comments. She had right. looked at the draft language, just said maybe minor, nothing nothing of substance. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, oh, Councilman Yonder. Yeah, I just wanted to say I'm appreciative of these changes. I think, uh, they're, you know, they're very helpful, and I'm glad we included them. Uh, you know, particularly, uh, you know, the health components uh, and environmental resilience. And I just, I think, this, so I just wanted to say that. Glad we uh, glad we're doing it. I you're, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it it wouldn't be as good of a document without these pieces. Uh, it, you've got to address these topics explicitly as well as weaving them through. So, thank you. Okay. With that, um, the next uh, section on the introduction again with adding this additional language is the piece about the health and health for all ages. And we had received that as comments and it came after the initial discussion of the introduction. So um, on page six, you'll see some um, places that can get tweaked and embellished to help really make that, that story come through a little more. And then at the bottom of page six, you'll see some language related to, um, and we've had this discussion under the Parks and Recs chapter. It really was about the distributable, um, equitable distribution of green infrastructure. 
Um, you'll recall in the Parks and Rec chapter, we actually had a definition for what green infrastructure is. I think we will footnote that here and do the same thing so it's clear to people. Um, but there is this language where we've tried to be consistent with what got added in the Parks chapter. But I know there's some additional language related to um, clean energy. Uh, and so I'll turn it to the chair. Thank you. Well, I wanted to, so when we met on this, I had asked for you and my staff, uh, well, particularly for you and Keith Levchenko, and I know you had done that and you guys prepared some language and then uh, neglected to uh, include it in the memo. Yeah. So yeah. that's my uh, fault. The, the I forgive you. Uh, yeah. I just wanted, I wanted to be clear to the other committee members. This was something that, um, that Mr. Levchenko and I had worked with um, your staff on weeks and weeks ago. Um, and it was one of those things that got put aside and then in all the things we were doing to get the draft together. So my apologies that it didn't get into okay. the draft. It happens. So in other words, the point is, this is not a surprise or anything different that we have not already talked about. So the uh, Pam, do you have the text? Can you can you share? Um, I have a version. I don't know. I'm hoping it's. I think yeah, you should, I will. You should take, a, take a second to go through the email to get the latest because we got feedback. Um, I have the the latest from your staff. I have the latest from your staff, uh, Chair Reamer. Okay, so why don't you go ahead and, and read that, please? Okay, let me, I'll share my screen, that will help. Um, so it's language that would go um, under in the in the introduction under this environmental resilience section um and there's two primary sections under here there's opportunities and challenges and you'll see down below there's a section sorry um on how thrive addresses environmental resilience um so the first piece of it is here in the that is highlighted for people if you can see that on the screen and it, and it adds the text um it, can you uh, pam do you mind please if you can increase the size <laughs> of your view yeah to, Oops, like a, sorry about that. Does that help? There you go. Now you're okay. talking. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah. So it's this. I'm just sorry. I wanted to show people this section and then this text. So uh, it starts with Montgomery County has made progress in reducing its greenhouse gas emissions, key contributor to climate change, but has much farther to go to meet its goal of eliminating these emissions by 2035. And the additional text is it will require significant changes in both the transportation and building sectors of the county. For transportation, the county should contemplate policies to facilitate a transition to electric vehicles or other zero emission technologies. For buildings, both existing and new construction, the county should consider a combination of energy conservation measures and clean energy generation, such as rooftop solar PV. There's another change down below, but I could just do one and then the other. It's up to you. No, oh, that's good. I think that expresses it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the point also being like, even as we move to electric vehicles, we still have to reduce driving because we can't, you know, it's a lot of demand on the on the electricity grid. And that, that's the next sentence, yeah, that I didn't read is really about, yeah, making that effort to say it's also about reduced driving. Yeah. That's what we're joining. Uh, Yes, I had sent a, I can't tell if this reflects, this is all happening in real time here, but I'm just, I'm literally trying to look. I had sent some suggestions after we had received this to your, we had been going back and forth. So just, it, they were very minor. I'm generally fine with the language. I just think the second sentence, for so yeah, it was for transportation. Uh, the second highlighted sentence, uh, we added uh, the county should contemplate policies to facilitate uh, a transition uh, which which was uh, to zero emissions um, that's and, what you wanted to see because I see that there oh I believe this um, reflects your oh okay yeah I'm trying to see here yes <laughs> okay, that, no. does, that does reflect that on the first one but not on the second one is what right. it looks like to me unless I'm so what I see is that the change that council member Joanda was suggesting was to rather than would be to say a transition to zero emissions vehicles and then you don't have to say electric and to cut out the parentheses correct that's what i saw 
Yes. And I, I think, see. and this does not yeah. say that. Yeah. Right. And then the other one would be um, in the second sentence, there's another slight change in it. Um, for buildings, both existing and new, the county should consider, and then it's just should consider. I kind of know. I guess that's it. Yeah, I'm fine with the second one. I just, the first, if you could just do the first one, that would be good. Okay. Is the committee is good with that? So instead of electric vehicles, zero emission vehicles. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. And then no parenthesis to right. say. Yeah. That seems fine because, you know, there could be other technologies. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so I just going to note while we have this open, because there was another um, piece of this that um, Chair Reamer wanted. This here in the middle that's um, underlined, underlines need added, was, was just covered in the staff report. It's the part about the equitable distribution of green infrastructure um, and energy. But then down here was the last piece, um, and it was the second part of what Councilmember Reamer was um, hoping to add um, to, again, bolster this idea of what we need to do to prepare moving forward the uh, response to climate change. Yep. So, you know, I think this is really vital, and I think we ought to take these issues head on and, and uh you know, plan like we're starting here from a position of, of real uh, concern about climate change and looking to how we can make a difference here locally. So that's what this uh, language is getting at. All right. Are we okay with this? Any objection? All right, without objection. Thank you. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so with those added changes, again, my apologies, they weren't in there. Um, we are now on the conclusion. We're almost done. Um, and again, like all the other chapters, council staff, planning staff, and the chair work together. Um, and what you have attached on circles um, 51 through 55 are a um, combination, a, a clean version of the conclusion. And in the conclusion, it starts out with um, really a synopsis of the plan. It outlines the strengths um, of the county as well as the challenges ahead um, and sets this picture up and then moves to talk about, which makes sense, like how would you then implement this plan? It is, is the conclusionary part, like what's next? Um, and so it talks about the coordination role between the different, the public and private sector and um, the coordination between other agencies. And again, also, the coordination of the work of the planning department between master plans, zoning, subdivision, APFO, all these things will need to be coordinated and looked at and worked together. Um, and some of those rules may change. Again, that's all part of implementation. Um, but in this last section, they also provide what they call indicators, which are similar to the metrics, but they're in a much broader scale. Sort of like how is the whole plan doing rather than how is a specific topic area of a chapter doing, um, which is what the metrics we're getting at. Um, and so you have this list of proposed um, uh, indicators at the bottom of page seven. The plan also notes that these indicators could change over time, um, and, and they're not necessarily an exhaustive list. Um, so I, I think in, in ending to, to talk about the conclusion, I think a um, thing that the committee should consider or to make clear in the draft is um, there's going to be a follow-up document with actions that's been discussed through all of these chapters. It's not a it's not an appendix to the plan. It is not part of the plan. It is a separate document that will be reviewed and discussed and evaluated after the plan. Councilmember Jawando just today has been talking about, you know, again, the outreach necessary when, when reviewing and setting up that action document. Um, and, and what I um, have suggested here is that the indicators and the metrics, they be a second part of that document. They'd be a big, broader document. It is fine to list what you mean by indicators, what you mean by metrics in the plan. Um, but again, it could be very easy that these items might change over time as the county grows, what you measure, how you measure. Um, but then getting back to something Council Member Friedson had said earlier, that he wants really definite information on these things. He wants to know, you know, how do you define each metric? How do you measure each metric? Who's collecting the data for the metric? Is, the, is that public data? How often is it reviewed? How often is it 
calculated. Um, and all of that can be done in one document that follows the adoption of Thrive. So you adopted the policies and the practices that you want, and then you adopt a second document later that you go through and say, okay, how do we monitor this going forward and how do we change our actions going forward? And that's it. Okay, where is this conclusion? Uh, so the conclusion itself is on circle 51 through 55. The parts I'm talking about right now are at the bottom of page seven and the top of page eight. Bottom of seven, top of eight. By the way, I know it wouldn't have missed the careful proofreading, but on page eight, how Thrive Montgomery 2050 was developed. Um, okay, so you're saying that urbanism as an organizing principle through, through the remainder of the document is effectively a conclusion? I'm not sure if I understand what you're... I'm sorry. Pam? Uh, I didn't understand the question. <laughs> sorry. I'm no, okay. Page seven of the PDF. Page seven. Yes. That's oh, page seven, seven of the staff eight. memo, not page seven mm -hmm. of the revised introduction. Okay. Right. Sorry. Yeah, we're on the conclusion, so it's page seven of the staff report. And then it follows in the circles, but it, uh, what we're discussing now is page seven, where it starts with conclusion. Okay, sorry, I'm not understanding here. Is there a draft conclusion for us to review or not? Yes, it's it's on circle 51 through 55. Okay. Got it. Okay. All right. And um, okay. Any comments on on this? All right. I I appreciate the understated. We've got a lot going for us, but room for improvement. <laughs> I think I, I I I tend to say you know the emphasize the first part, but I, I appreciate that. We can always do better. But so uh, I, I, I think that is uh, every council member's mantra, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, once you run for, once you're running for re-election, that's what you say. <laughs> that's what you say. <laughs> also, uh, true. also true. All right. Or maybe even when you're running the first time. All right, good. Um, okay, well, we'll take another, you know, Great, thank you. Um, I have not had a chance to read the proposed conclusion as carefully as I had read the introduction, I confess, so I will give that another read, and uh, I don't imagine I'll have any changes that I'd like to suggest, but if anyone does, you can circulate them to the committee in advance of our recommendation, and if it's a consensus uh, agreement, you know, we'll send it to the full council, you know, with as as amended. Oh, okay. So, Pam? So I guess um, next steps, what I will do is given everything we have today, unless somebody gets something to me in like the next day, I will assume based on all of the circle stuff we had in this one, the, the stuff you approved today that was an edit, the um, uh, whatever, the previous count committee edits um, to do basically what would be a Fed committee version of Thrive. Uh, Fed yeah. committee reviewed approved, you know, version of Thrive, um, and get that done in the next day or two, probably two days. If I'm going to have a day where people are doing any tiny, tiny, you know, unconsequential changes, um, so that we can direct people to that, you know, for more outreach or comments before the full council. Okay. Yes. If you could do that, please. And then we need to post that publicly. And I'm willing to have another public hearing, but I'm. I gotta say, if it becomes something where suddenly we can't schedule it for a month, and then as a result we can't get Thrive done, and before you know we start pushing Thrive into 2022, like that's that's a real problem. Yeah, so, I think what, we, what was suggested, and I believe committed by the committee, was yeah. a town hall. 
a public hearing is different than a town hall. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will. Yes, yeah, so I, I just think there's there's certain report, you know uh, advertising requirements. Yeah. And others, I think that might be more formal than what is necessary in terms of what the commitment was, at least from my perspective. And I'll yield to Councilmember Jawanda, who I think was the first one to raise this, and I you know agreed uh, with it at the original uh, conversation. I think what we have done up to this point has not been you know formal and dedicated enough based on what we had said. So I think the town hall is, is, is what I think. I think sooner rather than later. Next week might be too quick, but a couple of weeks I think is appropriate uh, and would allow the full council to, to have this uh, before taking this up. Uh, that would at least be, for my perspective, I think we have done good work. I think we have uh, taken into account a lot of uh, what we have heard uh, from residents. I think there's been a tremendous amount of work among the, the different staff members, particularly at the planning department and the council. And I think, you know, uh, it's an appropriate time uh, to do it. Uh, and I think it would fulfill uh, the, the, the commitment, uh, you know, uh, that we made. So I, I just I just wanted to know that. And I, just the last thing that I will say is, I think we should be very careful about taking too much of the time for a presentation. I think the time for the town hall should be focused predominantly on listening. To, uh, well, so but let's let's talk about this a little bit more, right? Because I agree with you, it, it's not going to be a formal, doesn't have to be a council formal public hearing. However, it's not it's it's not really that practical to do it as a true town hall where people ask us questions and then we provide answers. Because a, it takes a really long time. You don't get through a lot of content that way. I actually think we would get more value out of. A more of a testimony format where people come in and and get to say their their piece. I mean, I think that's a lot of the concern is that people felt like they lined up to be able to participate and then they weren't able to participate and so on. So, I, I mean, I guess I turn it back. And I would suggest a listening here. session. I, I would suggest yeah. a council listening session. And if the full yeah. council doesn't want to do it, I think it would be fine if this committee did it. I mean, we've right. already said that this is something that we wanted to do. I, I think we've committed to it. I think we need to follow through on that. I think it would be great to do it. If us wants to do that and invite our colleagues to join for right. whoever is uh, interested and the council staff will, you know, for, you know formalize this into uh, the record and into a report. I, you know, I think that that works. I don't think it has to be a formal uh, public hearing. I mean, that is a formal action. And uh, we've already done two of those, which is more than is traditional for uh, for, for efforts uh, like this, but I think a listening session, you know, to your point, that doesn't focus on how we respond, but focus right. on listening to the community and what their thoughts are on the changes exactly. that we've made. I think that's been the intention of this committee since the outset of this uh, conversation. I think that will help us follow through on that commitment. Okay. But I, I want to yield to Council Member Joanna since I, I sure. hijacked this particular no, no, conversation. I, I, uh, I'm in... Uh, I don't want to say violent, vigorous agreement. Enthusiastic agreement? Yeah, I think that <laughs> that sounds right. All right, great. So I think we ought to try to have it as a full council um, affair, you know. Um, but if that's not feasible, then we can do it as a committee event. And I like listening session. I think that's kind of the point is to let everybody get a chance to make a statement here about the document and perhaps there'll be those who come in and say, you know, I had, uh, I'm, I'm pleased by the changes that you made. Um, and, um, and we could do that, uh, you know, possibly even as soon as next week, um, or, you know, minimally the week, the following, um, yeah, maybe maybe it could work out. We could get an overview at the full council of Thrive without much, you know, without any amending, and then that night perhaps uh, have a listening session. Um, that might, you know, maybe that kind of syncs up nicely. Um, I think that would be. However, let's see. Next week is. Second, so that would be the. I guess that would be this the the ninth. Um, wow. Um, well, okay. So maybe we'll say that week. That'll be our goal. Is is we'll ask for that week. We have a the 
the briefing for the full council on Thrive. And that week we have that that's Tuesday, obviously, on the council agenda. And then we have the listening session that same week. And it could be Thursday, could be another day of the week for the listening session. Obviously, the briefing is Tuesday on the council agenda, presuming the council president will uh, can find that time. Pam. Um, I'm sorry, which week? I was busy trying to write the email to get it started. <laughs> suggesting that we request that Tuesday the 9th. Okay, 9th is a briefing for the council on Thrive. And that week is the listening session. So it could be any evening that week, uh, but we, we do it that week. So, you know, that's the introduction and, you know, listening and briefing week. And then the next week or the week after, you know, is any changes, and then adoption. Okay, got it, thank you. Could I just make a suggestion? I suppose you may. Uh, I was thinking you might want to do the briefing after the listening session, because that would give you, uh, whoever's doing the briefing, whether it's us or council staff or you uh, as the chair of the committee or whoever's gonna do it, the opportunity to uh, address some of the issues that were raised at the listening session. So you can explain to your colleagues how some of these issues were resolved or not resolved or whether or not they were raised at the Fed committee. Well, uh, here's the challenge. Um, I think we could regardless do what you just described, which is respond to issues that were raised at the briefing, I mean, at the listening session. But November 9th, November 16th, I don't know if there's council session on November 23rd. That's Thanksgiving week, probably not, right? Um, and then the 30th and then December 7th. So there's only like five council sessions left this calendar year, right? And if you assume one of them is a briefing and two of them are, you know, kind of a, you know, legislative essentially, that's assuming three out of five. So if we don't do the first one on this on the on the seventh, then really you you need to run the table on all other council sessions. Well, I was I was thinking perhaps the listening session the night before your first council. So well, I could be well, yeah, yeah, that's possible. I mean, I don't know. It's hard to respond to uh, <laughs> what we get on Monday night. You know, it's hard to respond to that on Tuesday morning. Um, no. But. Uh, um, in any event, we could certainly respond to what we hear at the listening session at the full council. I mean, there's no reason we can't do that. And yeah, we, I was just going to add, we could arrange it by topic area as we do the review at the council. We could incorporate a section at each review. Yes, although I, I think, exactly, I think we're going to need to group it a little differently for the full council. Okay. You no, know, there's no point in having a whole day on three things that are not particularly, you know, where nobody really has any questions or comments. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're going to have to maximize our our focus here. Um, probably just do the housing piece first. You know, um, mm -hmm. I think that's the only one. Okay, so sausage making about the uh, the process here, but. Um, I think that lays out a good scenario for us to proceed. I was just going to add the more the more reasonable that the timeline. I think that's going to help us with colleagues just from you know. So just something to consider here. Yep. Exactly. All right. So, is there any other uh, item we haven't yet talked about in? Preparation for making our Fed. Okay. So we have a amended version of Thrive to recommend to the full council. Any comments anyone would like to make before we take our vote? No? All right. All those in favor of the amended Thrive Montgomery 2050, show of hands. All right. That is unanimous. Okay. Thank you to planning. Thank you to council staff. And uh, we'll see you. Next time. All right. Very good. Thanks, Thanks everybody.
Westbound Randolph Road will be 